Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a listener-supported ministry. In fact, thank you so much for being part of that support for James Dobson Family Institute. The following program is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining us for today's edition of Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and we have a very intimate, family-centric interview to share with you today. Our guests are husband and wife, Tom and Dina Yoy. Conducting the interview will be Dr. Dobson and Dr. Tim Clinton. Both of these men have very busy schedules, so it's a rare occasion when they can sit down in the radio studio and lead a conversation together. In today's conversation, the doctors will tackle the difficult topics of depression, self-abuse, and cutting among the youth population. Tom and Dina Yoy have first-hand experience with this type of distress as their daughter began cutting herself at the tender age of 12. They'll share their story, one that is more common than you might think, of heartache, hope, and recovery, both today and tomorrow here on Family Talk. Tom and Dina Yoy are the co-founders of Hope for Hurting Parents, a ministry designed to support parents who are grappling with destructive behaviors or choices that their teens and adult children have made. Tom previously served as a senior pastor for 17 years and was a senior staff member with Campus Crusade for Christ for 14 years. Dina previously served as a social worker and is the author of the book, You Are Not Alone, Hope for Hurting Parents of Troubled Kids. This book will be one topic of discussion on today's program. The Yoys have three grown children. They enjoy being grandparents, and they make their home in Orlando, Florida. Our host, Dr. James Dobson, is, of course, a best-selling author, the founder and president of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, and America's preeminent Christian expert on child psychology. Dr. Tim Clinton is the co-host of Family Talk. He's also the president of the American Association of Christian Counselors and the resident authority on mental health and relationships here at the JDFI. Here now to introduce today's conversation is Dr. James Dobson on Family Talk. We have an extremely, extremely important program for our listeners today, which I believe is likely to hit very close to where many in our listening audience live. It is so significant, in fact, that we've flown out my colleague, Dr. Tim Clinton, from Lynchburg, Virginia. He's with us today and tomorrow, and Tim is the president of the American Association of Christian Counselors, which has more than 50,000 members And as such, it is the premier Christian counseling organization, uh, I think, around the world. Tim, it's a pleasure to have you back. And you agree with me that the importance of this uh, program today is illustrated by your dropping all the other things you had going on, and you're flying out here to be with us today. I'm delighted, honored to be again here with you and always excited uh, to have conversation with you about what's happening in our world and uh, issues that we love to talk about. Uh, I agree with you. This subject is um, so Mm. serious and important. Mm. The untold stories that are out there of moms and dads who have a son or daughter, maybe a prodigal, maybe it's a son or daughter who isn't just an extra effort child. Um, They've got some mental health issues and more. And the journey they've been on and the pain that goes with it, and the fear and the confusion, the anger, the disappointments. It's like, where do we go? God help us. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how the bond uh, of marriage uh, affects individuals. I've had uh, men in particular whose wives have left them who have gotten in the car and they're driving 100 miles an hour uh, on a freeway and stopped to call me and tell me they were going to kill themselves. I mean, uh, there's no way to describe the the agony and the pain of families that disintegrate. And I don't think any aspect of that is more painful than having a mom and dad devote themselves to this little baby that they brought into the world. And they <laughs> would... Uh, give their life for that child, and then to see it go wrong, to see drug abuse and alcohol and 
Uh, you mentioned uh, mental health problems uh, that uh, occur in many different forms. Uh, we're not here really to talk about all that, but we want to talk about the hurting families, mothers and dads, and what they can do to help, and interestingly, how they can help others. So this is of vast importance because the culture is warping and twisting young people today, and they're not getting the spiritual foundation that they would have that I did. You know, I went to a Christian elementary school and high school uh, where most of my teachers were also my Sunday school teachers. And I had a wonderful foundation in my family and home, but also in the public schools. That's gone now. And gone. so kids uh, grow up really questioning uh, who they are and what they're supposed to be doing. So that's all part of the pain that parents go through, isn't it? I was in a church service recently, Dr. Dobson, and um, the pastor uh, spoke to everyone in the congregation, simply said this, if you have a prodigal, you have a son or daughter who's wayward, for whatever reason, I want you to write their name down, and uh, I want us as a church to pray over them. And he asked them, after they wrote their name down, to bring that up to the altar, place it on the altar. I don't think I've seen a move to the altar like that in years, which just— Tears, emotion. The brokenness was profound. In a church— all these moms and dads going forward over their kids. That's why I'm excited, Dr. Dobson, that we have in studio with us uh, a mom and a dad to tell us a little story and the journey that they were on and the journey they're actually on right now. Let me introduce them to our listeners. They're Tom and Dina Joy. I got it right, you didn't got it right. I? I bet you everybody you've ever talked to has struggled with your last name. We get all kinds of things. You, you spell it uh, Y-O-H-E, but Correct. it's Joy. Yes. Where's that from? My uncle says it's French. So they were French Huguenots that fled France and went into Germany and other parts. And so, uh, you know, our family said it was Pennsylvania Dutch, but that's where that, yeah. it came from. Well, Dina, you have written this book that we're going to talk about today, and the title of it is a wonderful title, You're Not Alone, mm-hmm. Hope for Hurting Parents of Troubled Kids. Uh, Tom, did you help to write this book, or was it all Dina? She did it. Uh, it was her. You know. He was my moral and prayer support. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's essentially about uh, your daughter, Renee, yes. Yes. Um, who has had many, many problems. And mm-hmm. many of our listeners today may know her mm-hmm. because she has a ministry of her own, doesn't she? Well, it's not her ministry, but it is something that came from her story. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it was a story about to write love on her arms. Yes. Uh, There was actually a movie uh, produced about that. Mm -hmm. It was all built around her journey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, The title of it has to do with cutting? Indirectly. um, The person who wrote the story, his, I think his thinking behind it was that when people who have faith and hope go to someone who looks hopeless and we can write love on their arms. She had cut herself up very badly the night before he wrote this, and he really wanted to make a difference in her life, and that's a little bit of what was behind the title that he gave the story. Well, let's go back to the beginning and tell us about Renee. Yes, well, Renee was our second child. We uh, were excited to have a little girl because our first was a boy, and uh, Renee was a very challenging child. Stubborn, strong-willed, but yet also very delightful and creative and fun. Be a good title for a book, wouldn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, full of uh, surprises. Was she strong-willed from from the early days at, uh, we'll yes. say, two years of age? We'll say the day she was born. Um, we had come up with this wonderful idea that we had read about um, putting your newborn into this nice, warm, soothing bath right after birth. It was supposed to be so relaxing and peaceful. And we thought, oh, that sounds wonderful. Let's do that. 
So uh, we had a natural childbirth, and Tom was right there, and he lowered her in the water. And instead of her being just soothe and peaceful she immediately started screaming and we thought oh what is this what's going on there was a little bit of a window of what was to come uh she had her fair share of temper tantrums and things like that what we eventually found out when she was older was that there was um this dark presence that was um continuously harassing her a lot of spiritual attack even though she had a tremendous uh, spiritual awareness and depth. Um, all of our children accepted Christ when they were really little, and she had a great ability to understand deep things. But when she That's was a hypersensitivity, I think I I've read. Yes, um, that became known a little later on that she had a sensory processing disorder, which we didn't know was the reason behind a lot of her. Um, stubbornness and what well, appeared to be a difficulty to just mm-hmm. do what your brother and sister do. This toothpaste smell doesn't bother them, and this doesn't bother them, but it did her. She cut herself the first time when she was 12. That's young. And that was a big, big, which is like a, it knocked the wind out of me. Um, we'd had a head-to-head as mother-daughter. She was in trouble for something, and I left her in her room to just kind of calm down And then we would talk about the issue. And when I returned, I saw on both of her arms all the, they weren't deep, but all these scratch marks. And I just couldn't believe it. I didn't want to believe that anything was really wrong. I chalked it up to another temper tantrum of sorts and kind of threatened her with counseling if it ever happened again, like that would be some sort of punishment. And I'm very ashamed of that today. And when I asked her years later if there was something she wished I would have done differently, one of the things that she has said is, I wish that you would have given me the opportunity for help with a counselor sooner. She doesn't really know if she would have taken it and been honest or not, but the opportunity. So that first happened when she was 12. Problems seemed to abate a little while until her early teen years when she began to struggle with depression the cutting return when we were overseas, living in Russia. That scare you to death? To death. I didn't understand it at all. It just made no sense to me. All I could think was, why do you want to die? Uh, no one we knew did it. She said she didn't know anyone who did. The idea of hurting herself, she said, came to her from nowhere. Tom, as a dad, uh, you probably have your own well, you certainly have your own perspective on your daughter and her journey. Uh, I know that part of her story was that she was bullied as a young girl. She began to struggle with self-hatred, didn't like herself. There were incidences where she wrote in this book captions about her life to help complement your story, Dina, that you were sharing there. But she would say things like, I blew it. Why did I say such stupid stuff? And was really hard on herself. And then the depression and other things that really began to envelope her life. Yeah, it just caught us off guard and unaware. I was totally ignorant. I had never heard of this before. I had no framework to process it. You feel like it really just came out of the blue? Yeah. I mean, she went in her room one day, and she's got these cuts on her arm. You know, I go, what is that? I had never heard of it. You know, I thought, who put that in your head? I'm figuring somebody at school or somebody must have done that. But she said no. Tim, let's interrupt the story just for a little bit to talk about what that really means. Why would a person pick up a knife and and cut themselves? Why would they disfigure themselves like that? Quite a bit's now known about that. Uh, Take a run at it. You know, as children uh, walking through life on the receiving end of bullying, when you have some mental health issues already, maybe it's... Uh, neurochemically, you're not just right and more. And the Mm -hmm. sensory issues that you talked Mm -hmm. about, I know, Danny, you had talked about her being diagnosed later on, and Tom, you shared it with me, with this sensory uh, perception disorder or sensory integration Mm -hmm. processing uh, disorder. The the elements kind of create like this cocktail uh, or recipe that almost fuel this teenage journey now that she moves into. And you go, everybody goes through those awkward stages. If you have those elements all coming together, you can see how a teen can really get lost and the depression goes deeper and deeper. 
on this journey. And we're not talking about, there are some kids out there who just have these issues. It's not a, a result of bad parenting or anything. It's just their kind of DNA, their makeup. That's what we're dealing with. Uh, and Tim, you mentioned uh, a minute ago uh, the phrase self-hatred. That usually is at the core of it, isn't it? Because it is a, a loathing a self-loathing. And uh, Tom, you've already m- mentioned that she would say these things. Why am I like this? You know, I, I hate myself. And that is almost always linked to this kind of self-destructive behavior. It is. And in the midst of it, you, you begin to think, well, then how do you move into like cutting? Uh, and what does that do? It, it almost becomes an addictive behavior, believe it or not. And you guys know this probably as well or better than I do, that there's a sense of relief that almost comes over a child when they're doing that. The moment it's they be begin to cut, it is. It creates almost like a calmness, believe it or not, in their body. And so they're like driven to that because they feel like there's a sense where they need to punish themselves or they're not valuable or worthy. You hear what I'm saying? And at the same time, when this happens, it, there's like a release. It is mortifying. It's horrifying. That brings them back to it. It brings them back to doing it again. Again and again. Becomes addictive. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, continue with the story from your perspective. Well, we were, again, so caught off guard and didn't have any framework to process this. So we didn't know what to do with it. And so I think we were, were happy to just say, don't do this again. You know, and we just let it go away. And, uh, but as she became a teenager, uh, her whole identity uh, was confusing to her, just trying to figure out, because she would have a different group of friends maybe every other month, and they were totally different from the previous friends. You know, uh, one group, it was a lot of Latino friends. Another group was a lot of black friends. Another group was a lot of other kind of friends, maybe uh, athletic friends. And so so no, no long-term relationships. Yeah. It, she yeah. would change a lot. Uh, from your perspective, Tom, uh, was there the mother-daughter thing going on here? Often mothers and daughters will do battle. Was that happening at home? We tried to work together. Yeah. So we tried to support one another, and, and whatever we did, tried to do as a united front. So I don't know that it was necessary. She would get angry just as much at me as she would <laughs> with Dina. Mm-hmm. In fact, probably sometimes we would have the harder clashes because I, I'm strong-willed too. And so we got two strong-willed people going at each other. And uh, one of the last things I wanted to do is let her win. <laughs> yeah. So we, we would clash pretty heavy as well. The darkness only um, continued, though, as she aged. She got yes. into a place where she was starting to have suicidal thoughts and yes, behavior. Yes, she'd begun experimenting with drugs and alcohol, pot. And when we were living in Russia, she um, confessed to us that she had started cutting again because she was so depressed. And it was very hard for her to admit that. It was at the end of staying up literally all night, just us finally ready to ask her hard questions and willing to wait as long as it took until she could answer honestly. And she finally revealed that and that she had also become suicidal and had really struggled to not throw herself on the train tracks in the metro station or off of our balcony from our 16th floor. Um, At that point, we just told her, you are more important than our ministry or what anyone thinks. We will go back to America as fast as we can to get you the help that you need. But that was the beginning of our eyes being opened a lot more to just how troubled she was. There's a scene in the book um, that I wanted to share, Dr. Dobson, that really stopped me because I couldn't help but think about being a mom or dad in this moment. It's the scene at the hotel that you tell in the book. And I think, Tom, you were on the phone. She actually called home. Yeah. She's in the bathroom on the yeah, floor. Nice. Do you guys want to tell that piece? Yeah. Especially, I wanted Dr. Dobson mm-hmm. to really hear this. She had, uh, to write love in her arms, had become very, very popular and famous, and she was actually traveling and speaking for them on college campuses. And she had three years of sobriety, and she was all by herself. They flew her up, and she rented a car, and she was driving back after an evening of pouring out all this stuff that, uh, that she'd been going through that the students wanted to hear about. 
And she just thought like, well, you know, I've, I've had three years and I, I just think I want to drink. And so she went to a restaurant and had something to drink. And there was another man there who fortunately didn't have ill intentions toward her, but helped her get back to her hotel. Well, then the guilt started to settle in. What have I just done? You know, I've come off the speaking engagement. I've been in recovery. I've just relapsed. And she couldn't take it. And so she cut up her arms real, real bad uh, that she, may, she thought maybe she hit a nerve or something. And she called. And so we and there's had to, blood everywhere, and you you're trying to get her to wrap her arm with a towel. Yeah. You're frantic. I know, Dina, you were just terrified in those moments, and you're trying to get her to call the hotel to get them to come up and rescue her. But those scenes, Doctor Dobson, I think about all the moms and dads maybe listening right now, who might be in the middle of this. How horrifying it is at times, and how overwhelming and how powerless you feel. As and a how parent. guilty. And how guilty. Did you struggle with guilt? Oh, yes. Obviously yes. you did. Yes. What, Quite a bit. what did we do wrong? What good that we didn't do enough of? What and have those were, we done to cause this? We yes. Do? Nightmares? Mm. Oh, yes. Yes. Dreaming that she died. I can't believe what you... Well, I mean, I can, mm. but I can hardly imagine the the depth of the despair. Mm-hmm. Uh, did I understand uh, that you were in Russia when this serious uh, account occurred? No. No, we had come home. She was in oh. Philadelphia, and, and we were in were Orlando. Orlando. This was several yeah. years later. By that time, she was already 22. We'd been yeah. up and on, on this roller coaster. She'd been in rehabs numerous times by then. Yeah, a long journey, and and the trauma of her being hospitalized and Baker acted numerous times. Um, At this point, never knowing, is she dead or alive? Will she just disappear one day, and we'll never, ever know what happened to her? What about Um, the spiritual dimension? mm. Well, as Dana related, uh, she was very strong spiritually when she was young. And, in fact, in Russia, she was a flaming evangelist. Uh, we had Bibles mm-hmm. that we had with us, just stacks and stacks of them to hand out. She would take a backpack full of Bibles to school, <laughs> and her goal was to give every one of those Bibles away in the subway, you know, in the metro or something, on her way to school. Mm-hmm. And she would weep over her friends that she knew hadn't received Christ. She would mm-hmm. cry over them and just pray for them that they would come to Christ. So she had a very, very deep spiritual passion. And from an outsider looking at her life— People would assume that she's rejected Christ, she's not a Christian. And when we talked to her about this later on, she said, you know, people don't understand, but I never rejected God. I never stopped believing. (laughs) She said, but, you know, I guess I just wanted to be in control. I didn't want to surrender everything, and so I just wanted to be my own boss. That's the strong will coming Mm -hmm. out again. But the enemy has seemed to really been right on her heels a lot. Tim, this is one of those programs that just can't be broken, and yet it has to be because we're out of time. We're not going to be on the air, but just another minute or two. So uh, if you will sit tight, we will continue the conversation and let people hear what we're about to say tomorrow. Is that okay? Yes. And uh, we will uh, tell people the rest of the story. We can't leave people in this despair, however. Uh, your, your book is really a book of hope. Mm-hmm. And there is good news coming, right? Yes, there is. And I like people to know what my friend told me. Uh, there are no promises or guarantees, but as long as your child is still breathing, there is still hope. And you're still on your knees praying, aren't you? Always. (laughs) Okay, we'll pick it up next time. I'm Roger Marsh, and it is true. There is always hope, because we serve the God of hope and redemption. You've been listening to the first half of an incredibly difficult and vulnerable conversation featuring Dr. Dobson, his co-host, Dr. Tim Clinton, and their guests, Tom and Dina Yoy. Tom and Dina's daughter struggled with depression and self-harm for years. She abused drugs and alcohol and was suicidal. 
Thanks to the prayer and support of her family and friends, though, and because of God's grace, she is now doing quite well. Tom and Dina will share more about that on tomorrow's broadcast. In the meantime, if you'd like to learn more about Tom and Dina or their ministry called Hope for Hurting Parents, please visit our broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. That's drjamesdobson.org, and then select the Broadcast tab. You'll find a couple of links there, one to their ministry and the other one to Dina Yoy's book called You Are Not Alone. Now, before we go, I'd like to offer a resource for parents. If you think that you or your child would benefit from the godly perspective of a Christian counselor, visit connect.aacc.net. You'll find a comprehensive directory of mental health professionals who are members of the American Association of Christian Counselors, and you can search by zip code to find a counselor near you. That's connect.aacc.net. And be sure to join us again tomorrow to hear the conclusion of Dr. Dobson and Dr. Clinton's compassionate conversation with Tom and Dina Yoy, right here on Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.